proving itself over the jungles of Vietnam, the A-6 intruder quickly becomes the backbone of naval air attack. Fighting day or night in all weather conditions, the A-6's durability is unmatched. 25 years later, it will wreak havoc over the sands of Iraq. Over 30 years ago, emerged one of the greatest airplanes ever to be deployed from an American aircraft carrier, the A-6 Intruder. Primary mission is uh, day CQ, and secondary mission is uh, day flight time. Today, a new generation of intruder pilot prepares for a mission aboard an aircraft that was designed before most of them were born. This is attack squadron VA-34. V stands for fixed wing, A for attack. The men are being briefed one level below the flight deck where a flurry of activity is already underway. The planes are given final preparations as the rescue helicopter is launched. All day, it will hover next to the ship, waiting for a disaster that all hope will never come. For the naval aviator, nothing is ever routine. If the pilot gets a cold cat shot, he will have less than a second to decide whether to attempt to power out of his predicament or to leave his multi-million dollar aircraft behind in a life-saving injection. Upon landing, he must guide his aircraft on a precise descent to safety. Too high, and he will be forced to plunge downward at the last moment, most likely snapping his landing gear. Too low, and he will hit the back end of the ship. Too far to the right, and he hits the control tower. Too far to the left, and a hundred million dollars worth of aircraft will go up in flames. Like all naval aviators, the men of Attack Squadron 34 face this challenge twice a day. But because they fly the all-weather A-6 intruder, they are expected to carry out their mission even when massive waves come crashing over the 60-foot bow. Whether the sun is shining or the seas are storming, the intruder's mission goes on. All weather and night attack is the mission of the A-6, and has been for 30 years. In conditions that keep most airplanes grounded, the A-6 is in its element. The Naval Air Station at Oceana, near Virginia Beach, is the home of the Navy's attack wing for the eastern United States. In February 1963, the training squadron VA-42 became the first Navy squadron to receive intruders. At the time, the plane brandished state-of-the-art electronics, representing the future of naval air warfare. However, that was over three decades ago. Now the rugged workhorse of the U.S. Navy faces the twilight of its service career. The fact that the intruder has lasted as long as it has is a surprise, even to those who flew it in its early stages. Although a lengthy service career may please designers by being a vindication of their ideas, for the top gun generation, being assigned to fly an old plane is not exactly flattering. Lieutenant Pete Rasnick explains. When I first started flying the A6, is about when Top Gun came out. And so when I got my wings, everybody wanted to be an F-14 pilot. Um, when I got here, I was, I have to admit, I was a little bit disappointed initially before I flew the airplane because I saw these Tomcats taking off. Um, I quickly, though, changed my mind when I learned about the mission of the A-6 uh, and, and learned about its capabilities. Uh, flying low level, all weather, night, uh, dropping uh, all different types of ordnance. I quickly realized that uh, this was uh, the mission that I I thought I was cut out to do. I was initially a little disappointed, but once I got here, saw the mission, saw what was involved, uh, you get a real hands-on, get to see your results right away, the bombs hit the target, and what have you. I feel like I'm more a part of the crew, sitting side by side, I feel like we're more of a team in the aircraft. I'll never forget my first flight. It was a low-level flight, and it was a, a real rush. 
We took off and flew uh, for about 20 minutes at uh, around 500, 300 feet above the deck at uh, in excess of 400 knots, and it was just one of the neatest things that I had ever done. And I knew right away that that's what I wanted to do, was flying an A6. Because intruder crews fly the ship's oldest plane, they often take occasion to teach the pilots of the newer aircraft not to complain. It's not uncommon to have other uh, aircraft types complaining about their old aircraft, especially the F-18 community. When we were on cruise, they were complaining about their old F-18s that were, you know, seven and eight years old. And I looked at them and just laughed because we were flying. Our newest planes were only seven and eight years old. So those guys, uh, they don't know what an old airplane is. We fly an old airplane. <laughs> the A-6 may be an old plane, but there are none who will question its effectiveness. In fact, 30 years after the first flight of the prototype, the venerable intruder was again flying into harm's way. On August 20th, 1990, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and declared it part of Iraq. What followed was the largest deployment of United States forces since the Vietnam War. Anticipating a further push into the oil-rich countries of the Arabian Peninsula, vast armies were gathering on the northern tier of Saudi Arabia. For the U.S. Navy, conflict in the Persian Gulf was nothing new. Throughout the long war between Iran and Iraq, U.S. naval forces were deployed to provide safe passage for oil tankers. Therefore, at the beginning of Desert Shield, much of the U.S. Navy was already poised to strike. As the January 15th deadline approached, most of the world waited in uncertainty. However, military leaders were fully aware of the strategy to be taken if Saddam did not withdraw from Kuwait. Massive and relentless airstrikes. For this policy of overwhelming the enemy with air power, the A-6 intruder was perfect. It carries a massive payload by any standard. In fact, it can carry more bombs than any other plane in the Navy. However, the intruder does not have the luxury of operating from vast runways as does the large Air Force bombers, but it must always return to its home at sea. When January 15th arrived with no sign of capitulation on the part of the Iraqi army, President George Bush wasted no time in making good on his promise. Airstrikes began immediately, and the intruders aboard the USS Roosevelt were among the first to be called into action. Intruder pilot Lieutenant Pete Rasnick flew in the early days of the war. It was a gorgeous day, morning, the sun had just come up. I uh, didn't see any type of uh, AAA uh, SAMs or anything. Got to our target, I, I, I remember rolling in on the target, and just thinking to myself, it just seems so benign. There's nothing out here. It's just like a training mission. We dropped their laser-guided bombs. I remember pulling off target, looking down to the left to see the bombs hit. I looked down, they hit the target. I looked back to the right, and a missile just streaked right up by us with a big contrail. And it's like my heart froze. I, I told my BN, I said, there are missiles in the air. Then I keyed the mic. And I tried to tell my wingman, who was now ahead of me, we had missiles in the air. But I remember my mouth was so dry, I couldn't hardly really talk. But I got, got it out on the radio. We had missiles in the air. He's asking me where they are. I'm trying to explain to him where they are. By this time, three or four more had gone up really close to us, and all hell's breaking loose on the ground with AAA and stuff. And I just remember I didn't pull the throttles back until I was about 100 miles away from that target. And I just remember looking down at the ground thinking, this plane is going so slow. And I kept pushing the throttles as far as they would go. It just wouldn't go any faster. And I remember uh, my being and I looked at each other after we uh, had about an hour's worth of silence on the way back to the boat. We were both white as ghosts. It, that was the one time we didn't think we'd make it back, but uh, we did. Flying during the day was not the preferred mission of intruder crews. 
Unlike the high-flying B-52s, intruder pilots did most of their attack work at low levels, well within the range of Iraqi anti-aircraft artillery. Because of this obvious danger, the intruder does its best work at night. Not all the Navy's carriers were located in the Persian Gulf. Intruder pilots deployed from carriers in the Red Sea flew exhaustive night missions over Baghdad, which often lasted over six hours. Baghdad was a heavily fortified city, and the greatest security bestowed upon intruder crews was the protective cover of darkness. However, as most naval aviators will attest, the most difficult challenge came not from Iraqi guns, but rather the long trip back to the ship. For us in the Navy, the mission doesn't stop once we're out country. Uh, with our air base uh, being in the water and being very movable, we don't know where it is when we come back. First, we have to find that. And after going through a tanking evolution again, uh, when I came back from my first strike, for example, uh, after going through this tanking, bombing, tanking evolution, uh, six hours later, it's now four in the morning, we're coming down to land with a boat, and my pilot had what uh, a lot of pods do, have a bad night, and he ended up boltering seven times. Uh, kept coming down the ship and missing the wires just barely each time. Uh, got down to the point where we had a low fuel light come on, he uh, had to launch a tanker, we had to tank again. At this point, one of our generators wasn't working, so I had to illuminate the uh, basket uh, with my flashlight while the pilot was trying to fly it in there. So he's under more stress. Seven hours have gone by at this point, and we just want to get the thing down on deck and go home. Uh, after all this finally finished, we finally got down on the deck. We both just went down and sat in our racks and just were very quiet. <laughs> we didn't say much. Uh, just the stress didn't stop just leaving Baghdad. It just continued on, just trying to get back to the boat itself. Despite all of the challenges faced by naval aviators and the deck handlers, the first days of the war were a total success. At all levels of operation, morale was running high. Live television coverage provided the world audience a play-by-play -play account of a seemingly one-sided war as smart bombs hit their targets with remarkable precision. Then came the inevitable. We heard that an A-6 got shot down, and it was an East Coast A-6, and I knew that I had a very good chance of knowing uh, the people that had been shot down, and we weren't sure if they had been killed or not. And then when they released the audio of the, uh, of the prisoners, I recognized the voice immediately of the uh, bombardier navigator who had been shot down. And then they showed, uh, the next day they showed the video and he just looked terrible, you know, from the ejection and from uh, whatever he was subjected to as a POW. And I remember thinking that uh, we had gone through some, you know, very introductory training into uh, what prisoners of war may go through uh, if captured. And I just remember thinking that he was going through that and, it, you know, probably lots, lots worse. And uh, it, it really brought it home to me, and all of a sudden, it wasn't a, uh, some kind of game on television anymore. It was very, it became real personal. Fear of being shot down is paramount in the minds of all aviators flying into harm's way. But for the naval aviator, it is only one of many uncertainties. Their ever-moving airstrip can itself be a more difficult target than any Iraqi bridge or Scud bunker. With zero margin of error, the naval pilot must put hook to wire with an accuracy greater than any of the laser-guided technology at his disposal. The war in the Gulf was the first combat experience for most of the men who fly the A-6 intruder. However, combat is nothing new for the aircraft itself. In fact, a quarter century before the outbreak of the war in Iraq, Naval pilots of an older generation were flying the intruder over a dangerous land far from home. In June of 1965, the USS Independence was making its way around Cape Horn, through the Indian Ocean, and on to the unsettled seas off Southeast Asia. As the utmost extension of U.S. foreign policy, the carrier battle group was again en route to provide what diplomacy could not. All the information on the board here. All right, now we'll get into of the, the several squadrons flight. aboard the Independence, VA-75, the Sunday Punchers, held a unique distinction. 
They were the first squadron to fly the U.S. Navy's brand new state-of-the-art attack aircraft, the Grumman A6A Intruder. Most of the men in VA-75 had previous experience in older A-4 Skyhawks and A-3 Sky Warriors. So for them, the new assignment was exciting. The Intruder was the most advanced aircraft aboard the ship. The heart of its electronics was the digital integrated attack and navigational equipment, more affectionately known as Diane. The plane's sophisticated interior seems in contrast to an airframe that looks more like a tadpole than a naval attack plane. But the Intruder airframe was designed with a purpose, tremendous strength and weightlifting capability. This sturdy body, coupled with its sophisticated electronic guts, provide a devastating combination. And on July 1st, 1965, the USS Independence steered into the wind and the intruder was put to the ultimate test. All intruder attack missions in Vietnam involved many other support aircraft. The Grumman E-2 Hawkeye kept everyone aware of the presence of unwelcome MiGs. Any MiGs in the area became the responsibility of the mighty F-4 Phantom. The intruder has absolutely no air defense capability, making it highly vulnerable to attack from an enemy aircraft. Therefore, an intruder never flies into combat without fighters in the vicinity. Many unfortunate North Vietnamese pilots would soon realize the Phantom was deadly proficient in this role. So proficient, in fact, that not one intruder was ever lost to an enemy aircraft. For all naval aviators, crossing the beach is the most symbolic stage of any mission. They are the fullest extension of naval power attacking always from the sea. Part pilot, part pirate, they come ashore, taking the land by storm, only to return to an unlikely sanctuary that is their home upon the sea. Even when a naval pilot finds his aircraft crippled, he will make every attempt to get back to the safety of the ocean, where he can be assured that his fellow sailors will pick him up only minutes after he hits the drink. As the intruder hurtles toward the target, the pilot must already be considering the most important step of all, crossing back over the beach. Early intruder missions were carried out against highways and bridges just south of Hanoi. It was clear from the beginning that North Vietnam was a dangerous place to fly. Well-entrenched anti-aircraft artillery was a constant threat, especially to the low-flying intruders. To make matters worse, the Sunday punchers had to deal with a variety of other problems. The extremely hot temperatures and high humidity had an adverse effect on the plane's electronics and radar reliability. This problem was aggravated by the inaccuracy of the early maps of Vietnam. Some of these early maps were as much as three to four miles in error. However, the most serious problem faced by intruder crews in the early days of the Vietnam War was related to the separation of the bombs from the bomb racks. The mechanical bomb racks had a devastating tendency to ignite the bombs while still under the wing of the plane. This problem had to be fixed immediately and was resolved with the addition of bomb ejection systems built by the Douglas Company, but not before three intruders were lost. Donald V. Becker, now a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy, was forced to eject when a bomb exploded under his wing in July of 65. Like many intruder pilots in Vietnam, he would not make it back over the beach. I told Don Eaton, my bomber navigator, I said, we're going to have to get out. And I said, eject, slapped his leg, and he ejected, and I followed 
two seconds thereafter. We watched the airplane. Uh, he, he floated over this way. He was a, a light young guy, 135 pounds. I was 200 pounds. And uh, he floated down like a, like a leaf. And I floated down like a ton of rocks. So when I looked down, the men were coming out with their rifles, uh, the soldiers ready to, to uh, capture me. So and as soon as I hit the ground, which was in a rice paddy area, I got rid of my parachute, got rid of my, heart, my helmet, and looked up the hill where Don was still coming down. I couldn't go up that hill. It was a big grassy hill because the enemy was coming from this way. I turned around and looked this way, and it was a big jungle mountain. So I had to run through the rice paddy into the jungle area, and I found an animal den of some sort, a tiger hole or something, and crawled in that and uh, waited until sunset, until nightfall, and then I evaded up the hill. But there were people all around looking. I could hear uh, people within 20 or 50 feet of me. A safe ejection and ultimate rescue has given Rear Admiral Becker a deep appreciation of those unsung heroes of naval aviation. The parachute rigger is trusted as with your life. He is the one that packs your parachute. You never appreciate him until you have to use it. Also, the uh, AME, we, they call them, the Aviation Structural Mechanic, who is responsible for the seat to operate properly. So you never appreciate those people until you have to use it. And then we came back and we bought uh, each of the parachute packer. We, looked at, we had to find out who packed the parachute, and we had to buy him a bottle of uh, whatever he drank. The rescue of downed intruder pilots is often fraught with difficulty. On one occasion, a Marine A-6 pilot was on a bombing mission over the Ho Chi Minh Trail when a surface-to-air missile crippled his plane. The bombardier navigator was killed, and the pilot was forced to eject into the inhospitable jungle below. North Vietnamese troops, aware that the pilot was present in the area, awaited the arrival of the rescue team in the hopes of striking an even greater blow to the Americans. The rescue force knew a bad situation when they saw one. Enemy troops had enveloped the pilot on three sides, and they needed him to travel east before he could be safely rescued. However, the problem was how to relay this message to the pilot without it being intercepted by North Vietnamese listening to the same radio frequency. Then one of the rescue pilots came up with an ingenious solution. He created a message that only a naval aviator could understand. The message stated, we think you need a cat before we can give you your trap. The wind is in the first three of your SSN. Cyclic ops is now. Do you understand? The message simply stated that the pilot needed to catapult to a new location before he could be trapped, meaning to be safely rescued. The first three digits of the downed pilot's social security number happened to be 090, which is due east, the direction the rescue forces wanted him to go. After four days in the jungle, the young marine pilot was finally rescued. October in Vietnam marks the beginning of the monsoon season. It was during this period of blanket cloud cover and torrential downpours that the intruder had its first chance to truly shine. Enemy troops once given a reprieve from air attack when the monsoon rain set in, could now expect to be hit in the worst of all weather conditions. The bad weather capability of the A6A came both from the strength of its airframe and the power of its electronics. The digital navigational equipment gives the pilot and his bombardier navigator a clear view of the terrain on an onboard display screen deemed almost space age in 1965. On a sunny day, this display is almost redundant, but in bad weather, it gives the intruder crew a powerful advantage. Deeply enshrouded in a thick layer of clouds, the intruder is in its element. Hurtling headlong through the monsoon rains, the bombardier navigator fixes on a target that the two men will never see with their own eyes. The intruder is not a very fast aircraft, and its unelegant airframe has given it the dubious distinction of being the ugliest plane in the Navy. But it is incredibly strong, 
and it is capable of withstanding a beating that would knock most other conventional military planes from the sky. The heart of the intruder's strength comes from a box beam that is milled from a solid block of aluminum alloy in a manner of construction one would associate more with a house than an airplane. This solid beam passes from one wing through the fuselage to the other wing and is what gives the plane its strength and ability to carry such a massive load of bombs. The effectiveness of the intruder in all weather conditions pleased no one more than the Marines on the ground. In the past, bad weather had meant the absence of close air support. As the clouds moved in, the men on the ground could be certain of one thing. They were on their own. With the A-6 now in the fleet, those days were over. The Marines could now expect full air cover any time, any weather. The all-weather capability of the intruder was no accident, but was rather the result of the lessons learned in an earlier conflict, the Korean War. The conflict in Korea saw the largest deployment of U.S. ground forces since World War II. From the Incheon landing and on throughout the entire war, troops on the ground depended on air cover to survive. For the U.S. Navy, Korea was the perfect tactical environment. It was a peninsula that could be enveloped by carrier task forces on three sides. The A-1 Sky Raider was the Navy's workhorse attack plane during the entire war. However, the volatile weather over Korea exposed a weakness that frustrated military planners. Aircraft could simply not operate effectively in bad weather. And in the winter of 1951, U.S. carriers often spent more of their time steering around snowstorms than they did launching planes. With these lessons learned, the Navy made clear its need for an all-weather attack plane. The Grumman Corporation, no stranger to naval aircraft, joined the host of other manufacturers in an intense design competition. In 1957, they built a full-scale mock-up of their prototype and a year later, they were given a $100 million production contract. The decade of the 60s brought with it a sense of limitless optimism in what America could achieve. There was no greater symbol of this than the Lockheed SR-71. This futuristic-looking aircraft was designed to take man higher and faster than ever before. In contrast to the sleek SR-71, the A6A Intruder is a study in practicality. It was not designed to break any speed records, nor could it attain breathtaking altitudes. With its bulbous nose and odd-looking fuselage, it was truly unglamorous. And in an era when America was reaching for the stars, the unassuming Intruder quietly entered squadron service. However, over the cloud-covered mountains of North Vietnam, the intruder was anything but quiet. During the monsoon season of 1966, it flew 40% of all combat missions for the Navy. But the plane does not fly itself. The pilot must get aboard the ship, whether the seas are calm or when massive waves come crashing over the 60-foot bow. From the time of the Second World War to the war in the Gulf, getting back to the ship has remained the primary challenge of the naval aviator. Standing on the deck, I've seen some pretty colorful stuff in bad weather. Uh, one night in particular in a thunderstorm, uh, the plane could not see the ship, but we could see it from the deck. The guy had his taxi light on. That's pretty much the only way we could see it. And uh, talking to the pilot afterwards, he said he saw the deck for about five seconds, had one chance to make a play for it, and he was there, and that's how interesting it can get out there. 
Well, there are times, uh, because of the nature of the mission of the aircraft, there are times when we're sitting on a catapult getting ready to launch, the entire time telling ourselves we're not really going to go, we're not really going to go, they wouldn't launch us in this, and all of a sudden, boom, off you go in the cat. We were off the, uh, working off the coast of uh, Puerto Rico one night in workups for our cruise, and uh, it was a night, a dark night, like it always is at the ship, and we ran into a thunderstorm. So we knew what was coming for us, and uh, when it was our turn, we got to the point where we were supposed to call the ball, and we had to call Clara, meaning we could not see the, the landing environment, we could not see the ball. And the LSO, the landing signal officer, saw us and heard us. He gave us a couple calls. The pilot responded immediately. And about five or six seconds later, we finally, he finally saw the ship. I never did see the ship. Right before we landed, I just remember seeing a rush of lights come up. We hit slammed into the deck, hit real hard. We got aboard, trapped, shut down. And uh, that was the most memorable landing I've ever had. And if I don't ever have another one as a pilot, that'll be fine with me. In the years after the end of the Vietnam War, U.S. foreign policy was directed to another part of the world, the Middle East. Four years after the fall of Hanoi, an Islamic revolution swept Iran. Then the war in Lebanon erupted, and the disturbing rash of terrorism that followed demanded the attention of the U.S. Navy's Sixth Fleet. On December 3rd, 1983, an F-14 Tomcat was taking pictures of suspected terrorist headquarters in Lebanon when a surface-to-air missile streaked past it. The F-14 knew that this was no ordinary SAM. It was the Soviet-built SA-7 heat-seeking variety which posed a threat to even the most sophisticated of aircraft. The presence of these missiles caused grave concern to the United States, and that night, the Reagan administration issued a retaliatory strike order against terrorist strongholds in Lebanon. The strike would be handled by the aircraft carrier USS Kennedy to avoid involving any other country by using their airstrips. The aircraft chosen to carry out the attack was the A6E intruder. For reasons that have never been fully explained, the assault was ordered to take place in broad daylight. Not an auspicious environment for the nocturnal intruder. What is even more bizarre, however, is the attack was scheduled to begin at 7 a.m. Flying in from the west, the pilots would have the morning sun in their eyes, while the Syrian artillery gunners would have the sun at their backs. One of the intruders would never make it back to the ship. The plane was hit by a Soviet-built SAM while diving towards its target. The pilot was killed sometime after the ejection and the bombardier navigator taken as a hostage. None of the men involved in the attack had chosen to leave early in the morning. That decision had come from Washington, far from the familiar carrier decks of the 6th Fleet. Whether or not the attack on Lebanon would have been more successful had it been carried out at night is a matter of history. What is certain, however, is that all intruder crews undergo intensive training in mock night attack missions. For an aviator in training, these night missions can be a hair-raising experience. Pilot Pete Rasnick remembers taking a new bombardier navigator on his first night flight through the mountains. We're down in this valley in West Virginia with the uh, mountains going up both sides. And uh, all you could see really was uh, the black silhouettes of the mountains on either side of the airplane and really nothing in front but a few maybe small lights on the ground. And we got down in there uh, to the lowest altitude we're allowed to go at night and this squadron in. Uh, I said, hey, look outside, see what this looks like. This is the first time we have ever done that. And he had his head in the radar hood. He said, no way, I'm not looking out there. I did it once, I'm not doing it again. 
Weaving through mountain valleys at 300 knots in total darkness is clearly an unnatural experience. Over the years, the A6 community has developed ways of making night flights easier on the crew. Pilot Greg Buck explains one of these innovations. These are night vision goggles. They uh, basically take a spectrum of light that's not visible to your naked eye at night and uh, amplify it around 30,000 times. Uh, makes, makes the uh, horizon appear, makes mountains appear, trees, whatever. Uh, basically, uh, it does not turn night into day, but it makes us able to see the, much of the ground at night. Hold this for one sec. This is how you put them on. Another helpful innovation used by this second generation of intruder pilot is the simulator. Although this simulator can introduce the trainees to the fundamentals of flight, there is no substitute for the real thing. This flight simulator, located in Oceana, Virginia, consists of an authentic A6 cockpit placed in the center of a perfectly spherical room that provides 360 degrees viewing surface. Because this particular simulator is used to train pilots on the East Coast, its terrain reference is an accurate simulation of the Eastern United States. Here we see the pilot approaching a power plant in West Virginia that is used in mock attack exercises. As we approach the target, the bombardier activates his FLIR, or forward-looking infrared system. The FLIR uses the heat given off by the surface below to provide an image of the target at hand. With this image, the bombardier can pinpoint any weakness, like an air vent or a generator and then guide his bombs in with laser-guided accuracy. When the pilot changes course, the bombardier will hold his target, even as the plane is leaving the scene. Okay, beam at about a mile and a half. Yeah, on speed, looking at 120. There's a beam, there's on speed. Okay, coming As with real Navy flight operations, the carrier landing is the most difficult stage of this simulated flight. However, a mistake on the simulator simply results in more training. In reality, the smallest mistake means disaster. Coming through 400. Our pilot boulders, meaning he missed the wires and was forced to power out in a touch and go. To boulder is not uncommon for naval pilots. If the pilot is coming in too high, it's better to miss the wires altogether than to try to plunge downward at the last second. The greatest cause of carrier accidents results when a pilot overcompensates downward in a desperate effort to catch the wire. Power, wave off, wave off. On this attempt, our pilot gets aboard with a perfect three wire. In over three decades of service with the Navy, the intruder has undergone a continuous phase of improvements to keep pace with modern technology. But one aspect of the intruder mission that has not changed over the years is the camaraderie between the two men who fly it. In the intruder, knowing the person you fly with is as important as knowing how to operate the plane. Bombardier Mike White knows the value of this relationship. The importance of flying with the same person on a regular basis can't be overemphasized. Uh, just the basic mechanics of flying itself, there's a lot involved, basic brief of takeoff procedures, landing procedures, and so forth. You fly with the same person and do the same routines over and over again, 
the two of you are used to that and pretty much know what the other person is going to do. However, even more important than knowing each other, the two must trust each other. When, uh, when he says he has a target on radar, I can't tell. I can't see the radar, and I have to trust him. And, and that's just the trust that you develop between each other. Uh, on the other hand, he has to trust me uh, to fly the airplane low, to keep my scan going, don't get distracted by something, and fly us into the ground. Trust is paramount uh, in this aircraft, and the designers took that into uh, account when they designed this aircraft by having us sit next to each other, and we'll fly uh, down two to 500 feet in mountain valleys in the pitch black, and that you know, elicits a lot of trust between the two because I can't be looking at the radar and he can't be watching exactly what I'm doing. One of the reasons they pair us up as standard crews, so you get used to your uh, crew members' uh, idiosyncrasies, things like that, you know exactly what they're gonna be doing and they're very predictable and you don't have to waste time guessing. Yeah, I trust him or I wouldn't, or I wouldn't, or I wouldn't fly with him. In fact, I, you know, I trust any of the pilots that are in this squadron, uh, you know, that I've flown with. If, uh, I guess for whatever reason I didn't, I wouldn't fly with them again. In the years to come, most of these two-man crews will be split up as the intruder is slowly phased out of service with the Navy. Although it proved effective in the Persian Gulf, the austere physical environment of the 90s leaves little room for aging military hardware. You fly an airplane for seven, eight years, 1,500 hours in it, you're going to develop some type of attachment to it. Uh, yes, we all wanted to fly Tomcats. That's when Top Gun came out. Uh, but I've really learned to love the mission. I uh, really regret seeing it go. Yes, the capabilities are behind what, we're, what we can make and what else we can use out there. But uh, it's going to be sad to see it go. Um, we're flying an airplane that's the same age I am. My parents are always uh, concerned about the fact that they're afraid things are going to fall apart around me. But uh, other aircraft, we, we see them come and go. <clears throat> we see them complaining about their maintenance problems and their shortcomings. But we always seem to make do what we have in the A6 community. We always seem to overcome any obstacles that are thrown in front of us. We're used to having to fight all the time instead of having things come easy. Uh, and I think the airplane is still very capable and still has a very, very much a part of uh, our nation's defense. Conceived by the lessons learned during the Korean War, the intruder will soon join its retired shipmates in the silent graveyard, located in the hot, dry desert of southern Arizona, very far from the familiar pitching deck that has been its home on the sea for two generations of naval flyers.